Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, Charlie Davies, David Goss. Some would say Thursdays are the best day for Extra Time. Those people are named Charlie Davies. What's up, boys? How's it going? Big show today. Cole Bassett coming up. Big move for him. I'm surprised we have budget left for Cole Bassett after we had to PJ... uh... Charlie Davies in just so he can make the show. I know, man. We, had a, we use one of our five per year, or whatever it is, to man. get him home from Montreal just in time. <laughs> Toronto? Yeah, no, Mon- Toronto. No, Toronto, heading whatever, to, man. Heading to Montreal. Did, I thought you were going to stick around in Canada, but, you know, I guess uh, the, yeah, the back I, and forth life. Well, actually, the reason I came back was for you guys. Mm. And I had to His get real to my, family. Get they to my have... stu- to do my study. I want to do it in my study. Uh, I was going to say, they don't have the yeah. internet in Canada. Toronto doesn't no. have Wi Fi. <laughs> No, I wanted to see my family, and I wanted to do. Oh, the, the so you lied? Just, just about uh, there. In He's my back. study, no, it's it's both. It's uh, both. He, he <laughs> cherishes his time with us. You know, a full week in Minnesota just simply wasn't enough for Charlie. Thursdays would not be the same <laughs> yeah. without uh, jumping on extra time. Big show coming up today from the AT and T five G uh, studios. We've got uh, Luchi Gonzalez, the head coach of the Quakes. Surprise, shocker! Nobody saw that one coming. We'll talk through that. He will join up at the end of uh, this season for the 2023 season. As I said, we're going to chat with Cole Bassett, who just made a loan move back to Colorado from Feyenoord and then to Fortuna Sittard, which is uh, a table down, a, a team down the table in the Netherlands, but a place where he uh, presumably is going to get a ton of playing time. Uh, I would also encourage you to go check out the interview uh, with Matt Miazga on the call-up. That was a great one. Uh, new uh, new piece there in Cincinnati. They hope getting them over the top and above the playoff line. And I want to shout out the MLS UK show for having me on this week. Had a wonderful conversation with uh, Henry Hewitt. So that was a, a lot of fun. Uh, can we start with, uh, first of all, we're going to pour one out for Tecatito. I mean, just the news that you don't want to get in a World Cup year. And, you know, look, Mexico might be uh, rivals of the U.S., but that doesn't mean you wish, you know, ill will upon them. Tecatito seems to be out, not just for the World Cup, for an extended period out of Sevilla training. So that was bad news uh, this morning. We're hoping for the best for him and also hoping for the best (laughs) knock on wood for uh, players for Canada, U.S., and any other team going to the World Cup. Stay healthy and make it the best possible tournament that we can. And then I want to get your thoughts, Charlie, on these leaked USMNT World Cup jerseys. They're showing up all over the place, man. Uh, certain, Certain people, including some of the people that will wear them in Qatar, have opinions. Do you have an opinion? Yes, I do have an opinion. I like them. I, I like especially the tie-dye one, the blue tie-dye one. I like that the crest is in the center. But I'd also say I don't think those are the game, mat, the match jerseys. I think those are like the generic type type jerseys. So I think there's a big difference between the two kits. Do we? What do we make of the emergency vehicles in the background during that take? Yeah, I'm going to say Just Brooklyn, that. baby. It's just yes. broken down. there's no you know there's no uh just clanking heater sign from back in the day it's just doesn't mean anything <laughs> yeah coincidence just, pure just pure coincidence just means the bqe is <laughs> falling apart that's all okay all right got it um I, you know to be honest i think it's the the way that these kits were released i mean to have them up in dick's sporting goods just chilling uh a month before the actual release with no explanation on the drop and we were talking about this before the, the show, Bar- uh, Brazil, they released their kits and the way that it's done with the Jaguar in the yellow kit, the traditional kit. And then on the blue kit, the yellow um, uh, Jaguar uh, markings on the sleeves, like sick. I love it. I'm, I am. I think those are unbelievable kits, but then to get the U S kit leaked via social media from someone walking in a Dick sporting goods, that yeah that that ruins there's a, it. It, it there's a, there's, there's no a difference story between it. seeing it on a plastic hanger and right. seeing it on christian pulisic in like a slick piece of media whether that be still image or video or campaign like yeah i just i think once we see him on the players that's when i'm gonna sort of have my final say on it yeah uh because it's hard to imagine what it's actually going to look like on the field and ultimately I think what you have to remember is like this is sort of the lead up to the World Cup. We glom on to any little thing at any given time because that's the news of the moment. But once the tournament starts, it's going to be all about the soccer. And if they succeed, if they score goals, if they have iconic moments, people are going to remember jerseys for 
oh, yeah. far different reasons uh, uh, than you a sporting win, You win in that jersey. You win in that jersey. People are gonna say, "I can, get me that jersey. That's the best jersey. I'm gonna be rocking it." So, I, I think it's one of those things where just wait and see. I I think the 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 white one to me is a little bit throwback to O2, like O2 to yeah. O5 kit. Yeah, it feels a little bit like the that. R, and as you said, Charlie, they won. And that's a jersey that I like a throwback to because Landon pulls off his shirt and beat Mexico Dos Acero in the round of 16, and it's dope. So I agree with you, and honestly, I don't know. There's been so many jerseys now. There are so many of them that they're going to have hits and misses, but I'm just going to wear the 06 Don't Tread on Me kit every single day, and I'll be fine. <laughs> Charlie, uh, let me throw these at you. Christian Pulisic, should he go on loan to Newcastle, Atletico Madrid, AC Milan, Juve? Should he go on loan at all? If there's a ge- <laughs> there's, deep there's, side, deep yeah, breath, you know, because I, what I think is a, sometimes the grass is not always greener. So to go to a club that all of a sudden isn't necessarily p- playing like proper and playing long ball or it's much more direct or they or they just don't have possession. I don't I wouldn't think that Newcastle would be the right spot, even though you're playing in the prem just to play in the prem. That doesn't mean that's where you, you want to be. It's a, it's a different mentality. No. I my think it's, word, Charlie Davies. I, I think if he went to a team Mate. That, that he's going to be on the ball, that's going to be, I think, it's going to help him progress as a player, that's where he should end up. So if you're talking about Atletico Madrid, that's a team that defends a lot. And if you can play in that system, then great. If, if you're going to be counted on. I think it's just really tough to go on loan from Chelsea on a very temporary basis and and be in a good a good spot. How about uh how about speaking of tire fires and places that might not be a great place to go, Weston or Serginho to Man U? Well, I wouldn't send I, Weston anywhere because I think he's valued at Juve and has a spot. Serginho at this point you'd send anywhere because it feels like the I, opposite. I would say yes to Serginho at Man United because one, he's not playing at Barca, but two, where he needs to improve the most is defending. That's, he's a great attacking right back. No one's ever going to argue that, but defending and defending some incredible wingers, some of the best in the world at a top club where the pressure is so high, that's what's going to help him become a better player. So in that situation, yes, throw him, throw him in that system for a coach that he's played for in that one season, he did really well. A coach is going to give him time, but the understanding is this is where you need to develop at the highest level and, de- and develop def- a defensive mindset, understanding how important tactics and your position are and just being strong uh, while you're defending. That, that I think that would be a great situation for him. I agree. And with what Charlie said, Eric Ten Hag, obviously coming from Ajax, he's going to lean on any players who already understand and fit into his style of play. And so Dest, if he were to come, you would assume would be a fairly pivotal piece week in and week out to what that team is, which is what he needs. A headline from Charlie Davies here, man, you top club highest level. Let's get that. Let's turn that thing right out. Yeah. Don't, don't be, don't be foolish. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. Who you, who would you compare Manchester United? You're going to tell me that's not a top club. <laughs> it's okay. Look, as an Arsenal supporter, Charlie, you're you're you know you're well acquainted with mediocrity at big clubs. So uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Look, just yeah, had, just had okay, to. Just okay. Had, I just had to, I just look. I get enough sporting KC guff from you. All right, I had to troll you a little bit. Uh, let's <laughs> yeah. talk MLS. We've we've done too much on the national team. It's not an international break. Uh, yeah. San Jose have found their their head coach for 2023 and beyond. It's been rumored for a long time that Luchi Gonzalez was sort of the first choice. There has been a little bit of you know, consternation, I would say, about uh, a lack of a final decision being made and kind of going through this season, you know, interim style, basically. And Alex Cavello obviously is well connected at the club and has a big role to play uh, in the future of the club. And Lucci said as much. But uh, yeah, now they have their guy, Dave. And it's Lucci. And nobody's surprised. And nobody's surprised because he seems to fit the profile. They're trying to build up their academy. It seems to be growing and growing and growing. They got a bunch of kids in youth national teams. And, and Cade Cal is playing at the first team. Uh, etc. Uh, he's a guy who maybe had a shorter lease at FC De- leash at FC Dallas than we expected. 
uh, and has experience in MLS and sort of a clear pathway to maybe improving on what he was able to do uh, in Dallas. What did what do you make of this decision and it happening now? I think it happening now sort of goes to how long this has been rumored and connected and how weird a year this was always going to be for San Jose. It felt like from day one, it was Almeida's done at the end of the year, but we wait the year. And so I think it was always going to be awkward. Um, and I think you're looking at a person in Luigi Gonzalez who coming off of being an assistant for a successful national team and his experience with Dallas probably has other options. So for San Jose, if he was open to taking this job and wanted this spot, then you wanted to close it as soon as you could and sort of guarantee your future. And now it lets them build, which was the issue over the last two years was there was just no idea about what the future looked like. And now Chris Leach and his staff could start to work on what players fit, who's coming back, who they're going to go out and look at and all that type of stuff in terms of what it means overall for San Jose. I think it's a flag in the ground saying that we want to be a Dallas and a Philly and a New York Red Bulls. And they've gone out and gotten one of the best Academy directors in the history of MLS or one of the best youth coaches in the history of this country. And then a coach who coached at a first team level made the playoffs twice and still helped sell Tanner Testament to Syria and Brian Reynolds to Roma uh, and developed Weston McKinney and Jesus Ferreira. And if you are San Jose now in your market where they hadn't been relevant at the youth levels and they're, they've started the process already, this isn't Lucci coming in and recreating something, right? This isn't if FC Cincinnati hired Lucci and said, build us an academy system while coaching our first team. All of the groundwork has already been laid. San Jose is already on that path. This is the last step to complete it. And now when you go about that area and you talk to the best young players and you say, come play for us. We have a pathway. There's proof there. Uh, and there is a person in Luchi Gonzalez who uh, I made the reference on MLS today to college football or college basketball of like, he steps into a family's home and says, we will take care of you. And we have a plan for your kid. And he says to the young players, like I have, this is who I've developed. And I believe that you can be at that level. It's a pretty big selling point. And it's not just at the club level now either, too. He's going to step in there and say, you know, you saw me on the bench in Qatar. I understand what it takes to not just get you to the first level of, you know, the club here in San Jose and then potentially sell you on to Europe and, and advance your dreams in that way. But I also understand what national teams are looking for, what the head coach there might be looking for, what it takes to be at that level and succeed at that level as well. And I completely agree with you in the sense that if that's their guy, they needed to get it done. They needed to, to, like, get the signature on the dotted line. The longer you wait, the more job openings there are, the more opportunities perhaps have to go down to the next tier of your targets. If he was your guy, you make sure that that is done and that 2023 is set and that Chris Leach can start to build and start to think about a winter transfer window in the direction of the squad, which has sort of been, you know, in Mateus Almeida-style flux for the better part of three or four years, but has seemed to – be more uh, coherent and more future oriented, let's say in the last couple windows, as they sort of acknowledged, hey, that this Matias Almeida time is gonna is gonna pass us by here. Um, you know, Lucci did talk about investment, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, in his in his presser, and, and here's the quote for those of you that didn't read it or see it. Uh, At the first team level, you have a good foundation of players, he said, but there needs to be changes, and there's going to be changes. Currently, the team scores a lot of goals, but they also concede due to a lack of balance. Tactically, I have clear ideas of what to do, so he he sort of has an idea of how to improve what they already have. And then, quote, let's give it some consistency, some belief, and let's beef it up with new player investment and staff support and facilities. All of that is there for the taking, and over time, you'll see the changes. Investment to the roster is important to me. Getting that commitment from leadership is important. What do you make of what this project in San Jose can become? I mean, the academy side, they'll build that, they'll work on that, they'll integrate players, and that will be sort of a core part of what the earthquakes are going forward. But you still have to combine that with with more. And I still think there are some question marks on that side as to, to what San Jose will do. There's a lot of question marks. I think in terms of developing young talent, that that was never in question with with Luchi Gonzalez, especially with, with FC Dallas, the, the amount of players he was able to to turn into uh, first team guys who who could have an impact and then you know potentially sell on and and really make a profit for the club. Great, 
But at the end of the day, you want a team that's competing for championships, for trophies. That's why you play the game, to, to win. And I think when you're looking at this squad, they play a 4-2-3-1 right now. Does he change that to make it look more like what the U.S. men's national team plays? Uh, plays Because that's the system he's uh, working with under Greg Berhalter right now. Does, is, does that come into play? Is he trying to, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming ownership when they meet with Luigi Gonzalez say, hey, this is our squad. This is who we have under contract. This is who we have to, you got, you have to make a decision on. What, what are you, what's your take on certain players? I think at the end of the day, the back line needs to completely change, right? It, not great defensively. Attacking, you have Jeremy Abobasi. Is that a striker that you want to build around? Is that is that the the striker that you want to say that's my guy, or do you say we'll have him for depth? He's he's growing, but if I can go out and get somebody and invest in a young, talented striker with a lot of potential, I'm gonna go do it. And then you look at, uh, I mean, Montero is is your attacking midfielder, had his time at, at Philadelphia Union too. Do you move on from him? He's not really a, a a proper number 10, I'd say. Kikanovic has had some uh, moments throughout the season. You have Chris Espinoza, who who at times has, has looked good. But then Judson and Yule, your defensive midfielders. I think for th- this coach in particular, you say, if you're going to invest in the squad, then let me go out and start getting some big-time players because they have the potential to be incredible. Who wouldn't want to live in Northern California? A, a gorgeous stadium. You're, you're, you're a a beautiful backyard. I think for San Jose, you got to have direction. That's all that they need. They need direction and start to spend money in the right way. You don't have to spend $20, $30 million, but go out and get some real players with real potential and that you can build around. I mean, I think Abobas, he is that guy. I think they've already sort of signaled that, that they think he is a key part of their future. And I think that's the right move. He just turned 25. You've just started playing him in the position where he has been the most productive in his career. To me, there's all those pieces that you mentioned that they've kind of just smartly. So put on contracts and in situations where they could move on, Mm -hmm. you know, the guys that they brought in, whether it be, you know, I think Montero is sort of a perfect example of that, but that if, if the coach says, "Uh, let's move on, that's possible. All right. In your mind, who stays? I mean, again, I, I would just say I, I think Abobasi and what he's showing you and the investment they made in him in the okay, trade that, market and the fact that he's player. going into his prime, Abobasi is that guy. JT I think, Marcinkowski yes, is Marcinkowski. definitely a, a piece. Um, I I would assume one of the defensive mids stays in Judson and Rometty, but not both of them, just because of consistency, and they are both MLS-level players. Um, I don't know about Jackson Yule. I I think he could fit Lucci's system really well. Or but you after, could tra- trade him. I yeah, was going right? to say, he has rumors value. around Charlotte, if you could get something for him, fine. Uh, unfortunately for them, the only contract they're really stuck with is Nathan, who has gotten worse as the season's gone along and it started pretty poorly. Uh, uh, and so that's one of the issues they have to deal with. But otherwise, I think it's going to be the young guys, right? Useni Buda, Kate Cowell. Kikinovich, as you said, um, Nico Sarkis. It's going to be all those players, and then probably Christian Espinoza and Nathan, and maybe one of the demits. What do you make of? And I, I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading the tea leaves wrong. That some Quakes fans are are underwhelmed by this, Dave. I I would be surprised by that. Um, I, Why would you I would surprised? too. I was. Why? I would this, sort of shocked to, to see that. No, I, I think it's it's the reason reasoning behind certain San Jose Earthquake fans being let down or underwhelmed in a way is because he never won anything with Dallas. He went to the playoffs twice in two and a half years for a that's team play- that sold every oh. one of their players, had no ambition, and now yes, coaches with the yes. national team. Okay, we're we're talking about. Didn't Jesse off. Marsh not go to the playoffs his first year with Montreal? And isn't he the best American coach? Didn't Jim Curtin fail for like three years? And we're he's talking the about second best though. American that, coach, Greg Vanny. That's why. That I mean, but you you make great points, but then the day he didn't win anything, and I think that's what why is winning. Some... Well, wait, this is from the person who said supporter shield doesn't count as a trophy. 
So the question is, did he win did MLS win, Cup or did, not? Did Dallas win Supporter Shield? Well, it wouldn't have mattered. You wouldn't have counted it. it I mean, did if, they win if we're not, or not. If we're not counting Supporter Shield, then Jesse doesn't have an MLS trophy. No, he I, doesn't. I, I would have. Who said I? Who, you don't count that as a trophy? A, a week trophy. ago in Blackheart. You're the most consistent. You're the most consistent team in a regular season. That's value. <laughs> but for the Revolution, and that, and the reason why I brought that up, they weren't interested in Supporter Shield. The Crafts won MLS Cup. That's my point. For some clubs, that's great. Supporter Shield, you hang your hat on. We're the most consistent team throughout the year. Ma- awesome. Massive. We're going to CONCACAF Champions League. Great. But at the end of the day, you want a ring. You don't get a ring for Supporter Shield. You get a ring for MLS Cup. That's, that's a, where a lot of teams are judged. So that's my point. Everybody has plates, says Charlie. Just go look in your cupboard. Uh, Not everybody has that right. So, so you could say he hasn't won anything, and I, I get that. I guess two years. That's why. Two years. So I don't even know the coach who has won things that was available for San Jose um, because not, not that many teams have won some. I didn't know Brian Schmetzer was was open to going to San Jose. Um, Steve Trundle had not, for instance, oh, you, hadn't oh, won anything. As a, oh, it had to be an American? No, somebody from MLS. No, no, no. It went really no, well for that, them when yeah, they signed exactly. a big international coach last time. So that seems like a good plan. Uh, and it's gone really well for most other teams too in MLS. But I would say uh, for San Jose fans, okay, if you want a bit of an explanation, uh, FC Dallas came into 2019 probably not as a favorite. They sold Reggie Cannon, replaced him with Brian Reynolds. They sold Brian Reynolds and didn't replace him. And so Ima Tumwasi has been the starting right back for FC Dallas for the last two years. So when you want to look at lack of ability to win at the highest level, which I would include. They went to Seattle, pushed as a lower seed, pushed them to extra time, almost won, and then they went and beat Portland in 2020 in the playoffs on the road. Uh, that It was a team that was built around these young pieces that Lucci has developed for 10 years uh, mm-hmm. and did not invest to replace them in any way. And so the team, from a quality point of view, got worse as they went along. And when you look at Dallas this year and what Nico Estevez has done, it's been on the back of Alan Velasco, Paul Ariola. They've now brought in Sebastian Legette. They have invested heavily in improving the team. Even Quinone came in after Lucci had already left. Um, so, so San Jose is going to do that for Lucci in, in terms of getting investments and getting players. Because what you're telling me is, unless San Jose properly back him, the same thing's going to happen there. You can develop players sounds, and you're going to lose. I would, I would argue unless every team does that, every team will drop off. If Philly did not buy Gazdag and Ura and they sold Brendan Aronson and they traded Austin Trusty, they wouldn't be the first place team in the Eastern Conference. Now, Charlie, you said, and I think you said it right, you don't have to spend $30 million. Yeah. You just have to spend something on a player. You cannot assume that when you sell a 16-year-old, the 14-year-old in the club is ready to replace them. And Correct. be at the same level. So that sounds to me, it sounds to me like Lucci. I don't think Lucci would have I'd gone shocked, into the opportunity yeah. with the, with like the same status quo that he had in Dallas. I would be he shocked would be, if that wasn't the first thing. Yes, that he asked he would, about. He would walk in there and say, "Are you going to support me?" Is this for and real? to be fair? To <laughs> yeah. be fair, they did support Matias Almeida as well. They gave Matias Almeida a lot of the things that he wanted. Like their spin wasn't at the bottom of the league. The Quakes. So if they if they keep it going and they're a little bit more targeted, more strategic, it's less like short term thinking and more of a long term plan that integrates the academy as well. Because you think about the value that like you know we're talking about Philly. Think about the value at the first team level that Philly's got out of the academy. You know, same in- thing in- with incredible with Dallas. Like it's crazy. You know, Red Bulls too, and you know all these. That's who they need to be. They need to get better first team contributions out of the academy. They need to have guys like Cade Cal have a, a progression, which he doesn't seem to be having right now. And absolutely, you're right, Charlie. They got to go on the back end and spend money and spend it wisely and, and have a profile of player I'll, that gives them the opportunity I'll, to rise as a club and win. And also, I'll, they got to keep Chris Wondolowski on the freaking bench. I'll, That's my I'll, other I'll, demand. I'll, I'll add this. I'm a fan of Luchi Gonzalez. I think he is a great man manager in terms of really bringing up the youth to getting them to understand how to have success, putting them on the right path. At the same time, I think I want to see where Lucci goes when he does get the backing from the ownership to go out and get some big time players. So, what does that scouting look like? Where is he going to focus? What like what positions? Where where are the DPs he's going to be looking to? Because that ultimately really shapes the expectations of the club. 
Is this a club that you say, give us five years? Or is this a, we want to win now, but we, we got to get some pieces first and maybe one more one season under me to get everybody into the, the type of tactics we're going to be playing, the shape, the identity, and then year two, we're going to hit the ground running. So I'm, I'm interested. I, I know he's got good style. I'm looking forward to seeing him on the sidelines, see what, <laughs> what, he, what he's rocking. Um, but yeah, th- it's a good hire. It is a good hire. Yeah. I also think that Lucci would tell you and has told us that like he made some, there's some things in Dallas he would have done differently like strictly from sort of a tactical coaching perspective and approach perspective as well. It's not just personnel all the time, though that was a huge issue for him. Let's not like undersell that part of it. But I think if you're the Quakes, that's a good thing. That you have a guy who's been introspective about his time, who's sort of exposed himself to new environments and being under Greg and working toward this World Cup, that's going to be massively valuable for him. And now can kind of come in and start to apply some of those things uh, and I, I, what you're saying, Charlie, I wouldn't want it to be the Matias Almeida win now strategy. I, I, I'm not to say don't invest, but I would want there to be like a real, you know, like here is our path. Mm-hmm. We understand who we are, what we want to be, how we scout, the type of players we sign, the style of play we're going to have. And that's not just Lucci that goes the leech and that entire front office. I want to see sort of a North star that they're working toward at all time. That's established, that's consistent, and that has real sort of like, logic, data, conviction, and belief behind it. And if they have all those things, so we've seen any team in this league can, can succeed. So Not every those, team has those things. So all, for all those San Jose fans who are underwhelmed, who are uninspired. If they even the side, exist, maybe those do are exist, straw men. I don't know. Like, let, hit, hit us up. I, I, want, I want to hear what they have to say about this because maybe after this conversation, they go, ah, you, you, you got a point. Maybe we didn't see that or we didn't, we didn't have that perspective. So I'm curious if you if you are a doubter or a hater, if if you still feel that way. <laughs> uh, and make sure at Empire Goss for all. <laughs> yeah, you know, G-A-S-S. All, all feedback. Singas. Yeah. Congas, Singas, whatever you want to oh, do. You'll, you'll understand that a little later when we talk to Cole Bassett. All right, let's talk about the midweek action. Uh, Toronto dropped two points. I think that's the right way to put it. Uh, as the Revs keep their run going uh... despite a laundry list of injuries. Do we have to run through them all? Like, we got Justin Rennick starting and scoring, I guess, game-tying goals, it turned out to be, okay. Charlie. But uh, there are so many injuries here. Uh, to me, this is a, a very poor result for Toronto and a very good result Yes, for uh, the Rebs. I would say, yes, you could look at it from that perspective of Toronto dropping two points, or you could look at it from the perspective of New England earning two points. Because Well, they didn't earn two. They, they got one. Or they earned one, sorry. Um <laughs> They, they, what they did was they changed the tactics. They didn't have much going forward, but they said, we have to improvise. We have to get creative. And changing to a back five, I think, allowed them to withstand <laughs> Insigne, Bernardeschi, uh, clog up the middle for Michael Bradley. And Ayo Akinola probably just wasn't effective enough because this is a player who, when he's at his best and he's in form, so difficult to to stop because he makes good runs. He's so so strong, but he's still he's not in a good rhythm right now. So I think he still needs time. But I, I see a lot of upside with Io as the the the, the striker in, in that system. So yeah, Toronto they man they have so many weapons. Um, I feel like this next match against Inter Miami is going to be kind of like a, a make or break for them. Uh, was, Andy from Revs Nation. Let me just Andy from Revs Nation. What makes New England so hard to beat? They've lost two in their last seventeen, and they've been missing mm-hmm. key players like Bo, Veroni, Barrero, Tajiri, Shradi, Polster. Though he was back, played well, I thought. Kessler, Maciel, etc. Like, is it tactics? Are they more conservative? Are it just players scrapping? Is it coaching? What is it, Charlie? It, well, it's a little bit of everything, but in particular, it's the switching of tactics. Before, when the Revs played, it was. We're giving it to Carlos, especially this season. We're giving it to Carlos Hill. Let him do everything. We're going to watch. Where now you have all these other players, Gustavo Bo injured, Dylan Barrero. You have to go. We have to work together as a, as a team to get a result. Everyone is defending. No one is excused from having to put the work in for the team. And so now you go from, hey, we're just playing it to Carlos Hill to, Okay, we got to use Dewan Jones. We got to use we got to use Brandon By. We got to use the flanks. We got to use late runs out of midfield. And it feels like everybody is bought in 
to one defending as a team and and that the intensity of that defending but also capitalizing on the counter and you have two of the probably best outside backs in this league up there in terms of getting involved in the attack in their counter attack physically dominant and now when they're starting to develop their service you you have a, a great game plan now you, you get gustavo bow back in uh, i think a, a week as well as dylan barrero to, to jury shradi you're gonna have to start to have some some options and then your your dp who you brought in Vrioni, he's been injured too so you you'd like to hope that if you can continue with the same culture and mentality and you add now the, the game changers that you pay all the big bucks for that this team maybe has something heading into the playoffs let's Petr- flip the pers- i was okay, gonna say petrovich has helped too because remember oh, matt turner massive. wasn't himself this year so can they, i can i went from nothing to the best goalkeeper in mls patrick delaney and you said best goalkeeper in mls i heard you can petrovich win goalkeeper of the year even though he hasn't played a full season from june 12th to the end of the season presumably <laughs> Oof. we've had players win we've had players win newcomer of the year coming in the summer but that's a different mm-hmm. sort of award if you go look at the goalkeeping advanced analytics he has prevented the most goals expected to be scored which has been like you know that's the stat that i i mostly look at it's what matt, matt turner has been a lead at there's seven expected goals that he has prevented from being goals yeah essentially uh, statistically so far. He is clearly on top. I think in the end, the vote will go to Andre Blake because they will probably win the Eastern Conference. He is arguably the biggest star on that team. He is technically and physically, you know, pound for pound, the best goalkeeper in Major League Soccer. Uh, And so I think that'll be fairly simple, but I won't be surprised when Petrovic is in the final top three. Yeah, he he, right now is the is a top three best keeper in Major League Soccer. Not a, a not a doubt. He is. He's incredible with his reflexes. He gets down so quick for a big keeper, and he doesn't give up those cheap rebounds that you may see uh, here and there from, from various keepers throughout the league. Almost mistake-free. Uh, I'd say his, his biggest uh, area of improvement is when he co- the de- decision-making of when to come out because he, he's, so, he's a big guy. He commands the box well, but sometimes he's like, I can come out and get this, and it's, it may be a 50-50 ball. Don't. Now he's starting to realize, okay, I'm going to stay on my line. That was probably the biggest area. Other than that, he is phenomenal. Andre Blake's probably the only other keeper um, that you, you, you'd you say, okay, Andre Blake has done it. He's the Which, real deal, and he's done it year after year. But other than that, I mean, uh, Maxime Crepeau's probably been the most important keeper in the West, uh, I'd and say. I don't think his year has been – it's been, not at the level it was no. last year. And I'm yeah, pretty so I, sure there's a chance Sean John still breaks the the shutout record for this year, uh, but it's been so up and down for their team in general uh, that I don't think it'll happen. He's on 12. I think the record's 14. So they have he has nine games. If they get three more, he will break that record, and I don't think that he will win it. How about this one? And then we'll go to Toronto. Over there uh, asks, is it a sign of progress or a sign of dire personnel shortage that Bruce played two 17-year-olds late in a tight it game? It was wild when they came <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, I was <laughs> shocked, too. I saw that sub, and I was like, he's Me bringing too. on. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, okay, there, there, there isn't a better time for a young player to come up and get really the best experience in a high-pressure situation. You're talking about coming into, like, the playoff race – on the road against a TFC team that's right hot, Bernadeschi and Insigne on the pitch, and 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 coming out there to to to, to grind it out. I, I loved that Bruce Arena had to because there are no other options. At the end of the day, yeah. he had to play those guys because there there are no other attacking options for the refs. They're literally down to the last guys in on the roster, and so those guys come in and. And they don't look out of place. I mean, Noel Buck, he has a real big upside. He, he, he looks confident, big frame, strong, good movement. Uh, I, I think when you see these players put in difficult positions, and I think, I hope we're going to start to see more of that across the league. If you have some top-level uh, re- reserve players, young players, now you just throw them in. Throw them in and say, hey, let's see how you do. Sink or swim. And, and for players to react and, and, and swim in those type of situations – that's encouraging. Charlie, who was the other guy that came on with Noel? Uh, Eshmir. 
Byron Tarevich. Let's go, Charlie. Let's go. Come on, Let's Charlie. Let's go. I knew That's you the had sort of it. Perform- we I knew, knew you could you walk. He could, this man can walk off the plane and just throw it down. Oh, <laughs> God. Oh, Let's go. Uh, let me just say real quick, Kieran Doyle tweeted this yesterday, and he said it better than I could, which is Jaden Nelson's playing like Latif Blessing with like passing. He is, since he's been inserted as that 10 with K out, super active, covers a ton of ground, beats his yes. first man quickly, is really quick to the counter press. The first two or three games, it was, let me get myself in a clean spot and find one of the Italians. And then you started to see over the last two games, him bring what made him great as an academy player, 1v1 ability, final pass vision, in with what he's now doing well. Uh, and it's really exciting because it, it was a bit of a letdown the way he played the first half of the year. Like it felt like a chance for him to put his stamp down and say, I can be a starter even once these guys come in, fit us all together. He didn't. And now he is starting to play at that level. And the pass to Io Akinola for the penalty kick was just amazing. He, 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 I think he should have stayed on the pitch. I, I agree with you. Should, I, was, I didn't think he should have gotten taken should, up. Like, to, to be honest, DeAndre Kerr is not not that player. That's not who they needed. DeAndre Kerr is more of like a, a winger, yeah. center forward, but like second, third option. Jay Nelson is good on the ball. He, there were a couple of times in tight spaces. He, he does that quick one touch, uh, one touch, two touch, and gets around a player. And you're like, oh, wow, he, he rolled that guy quick. That's a player that you want to see on the pitch and continue to develop. His final product, I think, is where he really needs to improve the most. Like the final ball, but you said like the ball that Io Akinola was perfect. But can he, once he generates that inch of space, can he get a shot off? And that's where you can learn from Insigne, who I don't, there's not too many players better in the world at creating that inch of space and just letting it fly. Any thoughts uh, on the result for Toronto? I, th- I thought Lorenzo Insigne, this was not his best match. Thought he was a little ineffective, mm-hmm. let's say. And you mentioned Io. I mean, this was his first start in a while. It's been Jimenez, but Jimenez hasn't been producing. So they got to find a way to get something it out was, of those guys in addition to the Italians. It was the Osorio. wrong matchup for Io. Io, when you saw what he did off the bench against Portland, it was wrong when matchup. Yeah, what Portland. He's, he's playing against Omar Gonzalez. But it doesn't matter. Where he's at his best is stretching the back line, balls through the back line, like we saw against Portland, even though he didn't finish. Where mm-hmm. Jesus Jimenez is at his best is when the ball's consistently in the final third, pattern play, knocking it around. Revs played five in the back, sat deep. And yep. I could have played, although I thought actually Justin Rennix was good in this game, I could have played up top because they weren't really looking to be in possession. I think that's a bad matchup for Io, and it's unfortunate because I think if he had started against the Timbers, it would have been good, and Jesus could have started in this game, but it, you know uh, that's the way it goes I, sometimes. I would, I would, I would argue that it was the a great matchup for Io Akinola. He just he didn't he didn't make the most of those opportunities when you're playing against the Revs who are playing five man back line. They're gonna drop deep at times. They did come forward or they're in that middle mid block. Makun. Omar and Andrew Farrell, you can you can get at them off the back shoulder. And he made a couple runs that way, but that is the area where you can really get off at them is playing off the back shoulder or where he needs to improve the most is when they don't give you that space in behind. So how can you impact the game, Iowa Canola, if Omar Gonzalez is going to say, you know what, you're going to beat me. You have to beat me from from getting the ball turning and, and dribbling at me because you're not going to I'm not going to let you run in behind me then he has to learn how to adjust. How can I play one-twos with Bernardeschi and Insigne? Because they were doing it, Jay Nelson, Osorio, but he he never got involved. He was never that guy who they could play off of. Once he develops that part of his game, that's when he's going to be able to take off. Anders in the chat, quote, let's stay a little quicker on Toronto, and that's when we go right into a breakdown of Io Akinola's play. In this match on a Wednesday night, 2-2 draw, uh, Revs in Toronto, I saw an article over uh, by Joe Lowry, I believe, at MLS Soccer, predicting who's going to make the playoffs out of the East. He said both those teams he thinks gets in. Uh, so we'll see how, what happens there. Let's talk Jesus Ferreira, 15 goals now. Big win for Dallas at home against the Union. Big win. Really nice goal for him as well. That young DP contract looking real smart from Dallas and for Jesus for betting on himself in this World Cup year. It looked like it was going to be Pepe that was going to be the nine for the U.S. Now, as Doyle tweeted, this is America's striker. And maybe the 2222 presented by Body Armor number one, TBD on that one. I think in about a month we will reveal that list. Uh, what did you make of, of this one, this win? 
this moment for Dallas, for Nico Estevez, Dave, they've come into a really nice bit of form after a little bit of a lull midsummer. Yeah, the lull was interesting because they weren't ever getting blown out. They were. It was kind of the same games. There just wasn't that finishing quality and finishing, I'd say, to games. Because while goals were there at times, it was the final 15 minutes defensively that they really struggled. But in this one, it was impressive because you look at a young team and they, they got punched in the mouth by Philly straight out the gate the first 15 minutes. And um, I thought Mark Followell and Steve Davis talked about it a lot in the broadcast, rightly. And they asked Nico Estevez about it after the game. And they asked Jesus about it at, at, ha- at halftime. Uh, and then everyone sort of found their level and relaxed a little bit. And I thought Legette and Ariola carried them through that early part really well. And it was cool because at halftime, Jesus said, um, I was playing deeper in this game. And I told Paul, if he holds the ball up at all, I'll be making that late run and you can play, you can hit me as I come into the box. And that was the goal. And so it was exactly as they worked on it. It's exactly how they planned it. And then Jakob Glesis, an all-star center back, playing for the best defense in Major League Soccer, and he doesn't even reach a foot out. Jesus comes at him so fast, touch with the left foot, over to the right foot, and then it's the finish. It is a perfect goal for him because that's so much of his game, is dropping in, helping build through the wings, and then fo- and then following up as that forward. Um, and it's a huge moment because this is a Dallas team that's brought Legette and Ariola in, but they are still sort of looking at Ferreira to be their guy to lead them. And in a game against the best team of the Eastern conference on form, one of the top two teams in major league soccer right now to win in a big game like this and be led by Jesus Ferreira. As you said, it sort of just tells the story of what he's meant to the club, why they gave him that DP deal and sort of how historic this whole thing is like Brendan Aronson won a best 11. Tyler Adams, a good player, but Academy to DP to golden boot. If that's how that works, into the national team, it's it's the dream scenario that we haven't really seen play out in MLS. Uh, yellow card suspended against Nashville is Jesus Ferreira. That's a bummer, but he's had a pretty busy time here. He might be in for a little break. That might be beneficial down the line. Here's a tweet from Jonathan Siegel over at MLS Soccer. Uh, Charlie, Ricardo Pepe in 2011, 13 goals, 3 assists, and 31 games. Transfer to the Bundesliga for $20 million. Jesus Ferreira this year, 15 goals, 5 assists, and 27 and counting. What is Ferreira's transfer value? I, I wouldn't say it's 20 million because there was real hype around Ricardo Pepe and and just the way that Jesus Ferreira plays he's he's not your typical nine if you're going to Europe you know Ricardo Pepe had the size he had he had that he was national younger. team yeah so I think if you're looking at Jesus Ferreira I'd say 10 million would probably be the number uh for Jesus Ferreira and and then you're looking at what types of clubs would would be a good fit for him I'll tell you one thing Ricardo Pepe going for that money and not having uh, the the success that he had hoped and the league had hoped uh, does not hurt does not help uh, when other clubs are coming and saying wait the the player who was playing technically in front of you went for twenty million and and hasn't really worked out at, at the Bundesliga Bundesliga club it, that it's not a it's not a good thing to to have even though it's not Jesus Ferrero's problem it, it doesn't help the situation I agree with Charlie I would throw out Jesus is more versatile. So while Pepe does one thing that everyone will spend the most amount of money on and matters the most, well, there's no other scenario, right? He can't fit in other spots or other players with Jesus Ferreira. There's probably a a higher floor because if you bring him in and he's not scoring or you have a a nine, he could play as a 10. He could play as a winger. He could play as two forwards. There's a lot more options, but when you look at what happened with Tati, there's just no way you're getting close. To that peppy number. Tati won the golden boot and no, MLS no, Cup. Nowhere, nowhere yeah. near. And he couldn't even get, they couldn't get 15 million for him. So right now, we're the way things stand. The only thing that sticks out is if he starts at the number nine and he scores at the World Cup and the U.S. does well, that has a pretty decent track record of upping your number. Uh, all right, let's talk Charlotte. We can't give them short shrift here. NYCFC, uh, <laughs> it's... It's not it's not going well right now. And if you want to read about that, go check out some Sean Johnson uh, quotes after this 3-1 loss at Red Bull Arena. Technically a home game, of course, for NYCFC. Uh, they know they're in a in a slide. They know they're in a goalie, and uh, they understand they got to find a way to fight their way out of it. Right now, Is under the pushing. Is that a soccer cool against Nod? No, nah, it wasn't. But maybe okay. it's just it's like it's just stuck in my head. Okay. 
And I can't, you know, I can't. I, that would have been a good one. I should have said it was. That would have been better for me. Four, five, and four uh, in MLS under Nick Cushing, negative goal differential. They were eight, two, and two, plus 18 under yeah, Dyla. Just a good. little bit of Tati overlap with that. So it's not full Tati for Cushing, but it does not look like the same team in a lot of ways. But let's focus on Charlotte. This is a huge result for Charlotte. It's just their second away win ever, this being their first season. They have 10 losses away to put that in perspective and to do it against a playoff team currently yeah, in the home yikes. game side. I mean, th this was this was absolutely let's, massive for Charlotte just to prove that they can do it. Let's add more context to do it against NYCFC MLS Cup holders after being in L.A. on Saturday, yeah. getting beat 5-0, and then you assume flying directly to New York or New Jersey, shout out Newark, and then going and playing against NYCFC. Like, I, I couldn't have... I wouldn't have believed you if you said they were going to win this game. And to go win it 3-1 is super impressive. Um, and Swiderski scores a big goal to open things up for you, and that set the table. If Swiderski doesn't score in the opening 10 minutes, I think NYCFC starts to pour pressure on. Charlotte drops deeper and deeper. But that goal gave them something to play off of. And credit to them that they gave up the second on Chino's stunner. And they continued to sort of push Branico and um, the other pieces in midfield up a little bit higher when they had chances. Congrats, Charlotte. Queen City, stand up. I know you felt good about this one. You should feel good about it. I know Vancouver felt pretty good about getting a 2-1 win against the Rapids with a couple uh, goals from Gauld. Well done to him. That's a home win for, uh, for Vancouver, and they are in the playoff field. And if you win a game in the Eastern Conference or the Western Conference right now and you're anywhere in that, like, uh, probably five to ultimately 12 zone in either conference, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to jump up and be in the playoffs right now. In the West, Vancouver on 33 points. From six, LA on 33, all the way down to Colorado at 11. It's a two-point gap. In the Eastern Conference, it's like a four-point gap between fifth and 12th. It is absolutely packed up. So uh, some mistakes from the Rapids. That's not going to get them there, but as Charlie pointed out in our meeting, they're still on 31 points. Had they won this game, they would be the team in the playoffs right now. They'd be in sixth place in the Western Conference. Uh, let's keep running through some. How about LAFC eked out a win against DC? I believe it was, was it you and I, Charlie, or was it me and Matt? We were talking to Phil Ivanko, the power rankings producer, and we were saying, what's the over-under on goals scored for LA this week, LAFC? And I was like, what, eight and a half, six and a half? And no, they go get one against D.C., a nice performance from uh, D.C. United, even in a loss. Black and gold, Doug in Glendale, California, says he loves the show. LAFC is now 7-3-1 and one on the road. Only one team in the West, Dallas, and three teams in the East. Philly, NYCFC, and Charlotte have more wins at home than LAFC has on the road. And all four of them have eight wins at home. So just one more win than LAFC has on the road. Not too shabby. Not too shabby, a good way to put their uh, their season so far. How about D.C.? Anything to take away? Another, another Rooney game in the Rooney era? I think... Uh, outside of the last five minutes against Orlando, the best game they've played under him. Uh, I thought for the first 60 minutes of this game, they looked as likely to get a result or a win as LAFC did. Uh, they defended a little bit higher, but in a cleaner, more compact um, grouping, they just didn't look like they had any opportunities to score. Ravel Morrison at center forward made no sense. Um, but then Miguel Berry and Ola Kamara come off the bench. So it was a little bit odd. The other thing that I just wonder is how do you use taxi? Like 11 goals in whatever it was, 13 games in MLS. He's clearly elite. He's not a chance creator. It doesn't seem like, especially out wide. He's not a 1v1 player. You got to get him closer to goal. When the team came out, I assumed he was playing as a false nine or a center forward, and he didn't. Um, so I thought this was by far the best performance. I think Rooney said that in the post game, and I, I think he's right. What they specifically take off it to build with, I'm not totally sure. Okay. How about how about Atlanta? Atlanta fans tried to go under the radar here. Rob Ustry said, please don't talk about my team. That's a guaranteed way to get your team talked about. <laughs> Joseph hits 100 MLS goals. He's the fastest to it in the most depressing 2022 Atlanta United way possible, Charlie, because they lose at mm -hmm. home to the Red Bulls. V very depressing from, from an Atlanta United supporters standpoint just because this is a team – that typically is is going to be t competing for the top of the Eastern Conference with a healthy Miles Robinson. Is that, and can we say? And, uh, can we say typically anymore? Or is that sort of has that ship sailed? Um, 
I, it I, used to be typically. With, with a healthy team, it'd be typically. Okay. I, right. So I, right, I think right I agree now, with I would, Charlie. If Brad Guzan and Almada was there the whole year and Araujo was healthy and so so and Miles Robinson and Miles Robinson, it feels okay. like they, I'm just they'd be a top just asking five open contender. open ended questions here. Yeah, yeah and they but, were fifth last year on 51 points and and second was 54. So mm -hmm. it's it feels like Joseph Martinez though is is not we're not seeing the runs that we typically see from Joseph Martinez. He the hard darting runs to the near post, the the runs that. Are, are intense with with you know sharpness and pace and, and a real explosion. We're not seeing that from him, and I, I don't know if that's because of one the, the players around him and he feels like he's not going to get the service, so he doesn't make the run, which is also plays into a mentality position, which is not what you want from your number nine from Joseph Martinez. You want him to have that mentality of of making hard runs in the box, being a presence. He's he's like hanging out around the penalty spot now. He's always dropping off, whereas the Joseph Martinez that everyone's been accustomed to seeing is hard, hard near post runs, maybe 10 of those. And then the, the, the 11th run is a, a, a drifting off the back post and he's got a, he's a wide open tap in because everyone had expected him to go to the near post. So are we going to see the Joseph Martinez of 2018? I, I find that hard to believe now. And we, we, he openly talked about, Hey, I don't know if what my future holds in Atlanta. Well, I think it's closer to him not being a part of Atlanta for the long term than than them saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna stick with the Joseph Martinez that that brought us an MLS Cup." Can we, Feels hard to believe they would they would double down. Can we shout out Jamai? Sure. Goal off the cross, baby. John Tolkien doing his thing. The next corner, by the way, the Red Bulls were warming up down where he took it, and he turned. You just see him laughing with the guys. Like you could tell, he said, "I'm going for the Olympico." Uh, it was a really good performance for Red Bulls. It was sort of the first 30 minutes. I think this was Struber said after is like they were efficient. They were dangerous. I mean, if Klamala could hit anything, they win that game three or four zero. But that was the way they want to play. And I think it was good for them to get back there. Shout out to Daniel Edelman for getting the start and holding it down in central midfield. They've got him, Casares, Amaya, Yearwood. It's starting to feel like that's really the strength of this group. And it'll be interesting to see sort of who's around long-term and how they handle the value of players with the minutes that they have that they can sort of give to everyone. Speaking of value, there's some rumors out there that two Champo teams want Lewis Morgan. Uh, so something to, to watch How does that there, make any anything? sense, by the way? It's a $750,000 offer. They gave up $1.2 in allocation. Allocation. Oh, that's the worth, offer? I didn't even see what the offer was. That's the rumor that I saw connected. It was well, Millwall. Yeah, that's an immediate, and, that's an immediate yeah. no. And I, and I can understand he's, he was 25, maybe he's 26 now when they, when they acquired him. I could understand the idea was to sell him at some point, right? That's what Montreal is doing with Alistair Johnston. Like, that's not an uncommon move. But to go from allocation to cash, you have to really outdo that number to make it worthwhile. Uh, here's one at home for them this weekend. Uh, Red Bulls Cincy, they have not won a lot of games at home. They've won a lot of games away. Eight wins away, just three at home, which is not – that's not typical for the Red Bulls. Uh, Cincy coming to town Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern, MLS Live on ESPN+. Plus. Matt in the Cream City. Is, Cream City. Is Cream City another word for Cincinnati? Didn't know. I, I guess so. I'm assuming so. Never heard that. Thank you, Matt Doyle, for your advanced an metrics and analysis of the eye test of Brandon Vasquez's performance this year. Uh, in parentheses, maybe that will help convince Charlie Davies. I don't know. That run he made in his goal was sublime. I have no idea how he'll level up internationally, but he at least deserves a look in September uh, with the U.S. and Europe. He's in as good a form or better as any striker in the pool, and to me, he checks a lot of the boxes of the profile of a USMNT striker. I include this mail because uh, there was just a little bit of a shot at Charlie, and usually that results in uh, a <laughs> <laughs> Well, Well, one, I've never said anything about his runs. I've, I'm talking about Brandon Vasquez when – He's in possession. Yep, he doesn't got, always connect passes. Yeah, we don't got to relitigate. We don't. Is he going to so, be? Go listen to the interview. We had that in the yes. uh, which in the show from All Star. So if you haven't listened to that show, go back. There's Charlie having a really good sit down uh, with Vasquez. Why was there not He's a gonna, runs? Why is there not a run skills challenge? If there was a yeah. run skill. Then Brandon yeah. Vasquez would have put up numbers. It could, kind of, we could it kind of could be like tag. You have defenders that Whoa. have to stay. Could have to stay Let's close. Play tag. Uh, Why are we stop. not playing tag? Stop. Stop. We it need right tag now. in the skills challenge. But yeah, I think Brendan Vasquez is going to get his chance in September. So there you I, go. I, 
There you go. All right. Uh, uh, Ricky Push, intro presser. Pretty good presser. He's available against Seattle on Friday night on national TV, 10 p.m. Eastern, ESPN, Dignity Health Sports Park. I listened to Sasha Kleshin on MLS Today. Rave about him. If you missed it, you can search MLS Today on Spotify or any of your podcast apps and listen to the show on demand. Bingo. Here's some quotes. Uh, quote, Charlie, I'll get your reaction to this. Quote, I couldn't, um, this is from Ricky. I couldn't imagine this club was reaching out to me. I couldn't believe I was being called by the LA Galaxy. It's Real Madrid. It's Real Madrid Galaxy. Didn't you know? <laughs> you know it's, <laughs> it's too, too like, well, not for him, Real Madrid. It wouldn't be Real Madrid for him. Okay. But like, that's, that's what typically players would say if Real Madrid or Barcelona are calling you. The guys at Barcelona. So big shout out to, to LA Galaxy. Um, because obviously David Beckham gave them a, a real yeah man I think uh, he probably would have been he would have been like a seven or eight year old when when Beckham signed for the Galaxy it's an impressionable time yeah it's, it's yeah or or he's just really well trained in the media yeah. Like, uh, well, yeah well here we go here's some <laughs> other quotes from our guy Ricky uh, quote I like to take risks it's a new city for me I think it's a great opportunity good to hear it's a new city. And not just somewhere he's been on vacation. And quote, this is a league for young players. Trust me, in the coming years, you're going to see more young players. And then LA Galaxy head coach Greg Vanny had this to say. Uh, we've made, we've just made arguably one of the most significant signings in the history of the league. He stands with Chuck. To choose the Galaxy, mm -hmm. to choose MLS is immensely humbling and a huge recognition for the league. So, what do we want to see on Friday from Ricky Pooch? Is he going to start? Uh, what do we need to see from him on the field? How quick does he need to integrate? And the Galaxy season is basically like just about everybody in these middle table zones in the balance right now. Like they got to get results if they want to go to the playoffs. And that's a place that they haven't consistently been for a lot of years right now. Currently in sixth on 33 points. Yeah, I think this is a huge one, obviously, against the Sounders, right? It's a six pointer. I think we're going to say that 9,000 times over the next eight weeks. Uh, but it, what it sounds like and what we all expect is you're looking for Pooch to control the tempo of the game, to control the pace of play. And I think for the LA Galaxy, you're looking for a situation sort of similar to what we've seen for Toronto, which is, can you make turnovers more predictable? Can you make turnovers happen in less dangerous areas against you to help them defensively? And if you can do that, I think I believe there's enough goal scoring in that team. So if he can sort of shift the way they play, and that's why Greg Vanny's bringing a player like him in, and that's what he did with Victor Vasquez, with TFC at their peak, um, you'd assume that that's sort of the idea behind all of this. And then Delgado can make runs off that. And whether you're playing two strikers up top or, you know, the two wide guys, whatever it is, there's some predictability to what's going to happen. And then you can start to set Pooch up in places where he can hit that killer ball, which isn't his background. But if you have him in the final third enough, I, I think he'll be able to figure it out. Sasha talked about pace of play and how quickly he sees things and can execute. What is a good representation of his a talent and ability the rest of the way, Charlie? What, what would you what would you consider a successful sort of opening? I don't know whatever it is for him. This it's like a it's a brief period of acclimation that he's got to make to Galaxy in in a very high pressure situation. It's going to be tough. The adjustment period. It's, it's not going to be easy for him. I would say if he can get this team into the playoffs yeah. and providing and and also just providing opportunities because. We all know Chicharito thrives on crosses and, and balls into the box. That's, but can he also provide those little through balls? Can he, can he be the conduit between the back line and the wingers? Is the ball flowing through him? That, I think that's kind of, for me, what I'm going to be looking at. Is, is he really central to, to their possession and to their uh, attacking, you know, basically uh, attacking options and, and chances being created? Yeah, playoffs, influence, signs yes. of something bigger in the future for Ricky Pooch. Looking forward to it on uh, Friday night, 10 p.m. Eastern, ESPN. Alistair Brewer says the Sounders are Casey at the bat right now. That's the entire email, and I'll let you all uh, ruminate on that one. We had uh, a bunch of questions about who is a legitimate MLS Cup contender. Not just like, oh, yeah, I mean, anybody can win once you make the playoffs, but who is a legitimate MLS Cup contender? How many of those are there, do you think? LAFC. Would Philly, 100%. I would say for sure. You got to pick the two top teams in each conference, is, no doubt. Would Austin make that list of like legit MLS Cup contender right now? I would say yes, because especially if they're going to be playing at home, right? So yeah, 
LA, Austin. I I don't think Dallas Mont- are. Montreal. I would put Montreal and NYCFC in over the other teams yep. in the Western Conference. Interesting. What about Minnesota? Is it still too early to make that call? I could see them surprising people. Okay, but that's probably not legit. Unless, <laughs> if they're surprising you, just I'm just yeah, trying yeah. to establish. I don't think the, that Minnesota okay. or Dallas or anyone else down in the Western Conference is currently a legit MLS Cup contender. They'd all be, wouldn't be surprised as Charlie said, if they get in, they've got a yeah. shot, but not favorites in every matchup that they play in and it, roadmap makes sense. Yeah. To me, it's like you you say, yeah. hey, they won MLS Cup. Like I'm taking you to the future. And you say, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the only I actually think there's only two teams right now where you could legitimately say, oh, that makes sense. And that's Philly and LA. I disagree. I would say the top five. So the top three in the East and the top two in the West. Uh, but I would say in saying that spot, sp- spot, spot, I'm spot on with Thank you. I and that. I would say in saying that this is the normal breakdown of opinions. Sure. It's YouTubers. If me. Columbus or New England won, I'd probably be less surprised than if Minnesota or Dallas won. Okay. Before we get to Cole Bassett, give me your, uh, your two second. <laughs> Cause I see Anders being like, okay, you might want to wrap up, yeah, uh, hit on your ESPN that. plus game of the weekend as we hit week 27. All right, I'm gonna, give me. I'm going right now. Minnesota, Austin. Okay. Number four. Da, 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 number two. Da, 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 done. Da, da, da. Okay, that's a good. I, you did it in two seconds. Good job. Chicago, NYCFC. I want to see if NYCFC's slump continues, and this is a big opportunity uh, for Chicago. They need to win their home games to have any chance of uh, of climbing that table and and making alert shots available to all. So currently, thirty points. They, they got to get a win. Uh, how about you, Miami, Dan? Toronto, six-pointer, Pasuelo revenge game. He's been unreal. Now he welcomes Toronto into the swamp and humidity aye, of aye, Fort aye. Lauderdale. It's going to be Into the legend. intimidating presence of drive pink. It's going to be amazing. Uh, yeah. uh, and also, these are two teams that are on the list of must-watch because games are open, goals are scored. They've just been fun. Yep. So we have Friday, Saturday, Sunday action MLS, uh, two FS1 games on Sunday. Crew, Atlanta, and Kansas City. Portland will have full coverage for you on Monday. All right, let's get to that Cole Bassett interview. It's a good one. All right, let's go to the Netherlands to Cole Bassett. It's an at t 5G call to the field. Cole, what's up? Welcome back to Extra Time. Yeah, thanks for having me back on, guys. Good to see you. So is the is the cowboy hat out of the frame here? Can I ask <laughs> you that? Is. Where is that your cowboy hat? Is that the club's cowboy hat? Who owns that cowboy hat? I think it's the club's. I've had some goofy... Uh... Yeah, initiation, like <laughs> signing, signing, yeah, social media posts about me. I mean, that fine order was Cool Kid Cole, which I still don't know who came up with that one, but like the whole team started calling me that. I didn't like that one. And then I showed up here and I had a cowboy hat and they said this was like the teaser for the past like couple of weeks. I had no clue about it. Uh, so have, I just, I went along with it, but yeah. It's, have you ever worn a cowboy hat? Is that a Littleton, Colorado thing? Uh, I think I have at a Halloween party before, but yeah, okay. not before. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> your answer is no. He, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, not no, rocking no. it to go shopping. He's no, like, no, no. But I, I did style. appreciate it was the it was the LAFC move. It's like they they combined a lot of different stereotypes because they did the LAFC like look down, look up, yeah. sort of move, and then they hit you with the old salon like the saloon font too, you know, oh, like the did? circus style font. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I I only heard about it. I I don't know. My agent texted me about it. And, uh, nice. Like, mm. <laughs> what would uh what would if you were in charge if you're the creative director for your own reveal as a signing we're, we're taking cool kid cole off the table cowboy hats <laughs> that's a note of those two what's that video look like i mean i think fine Nord's video was actually very good um but it was just the hashtag that they came up with it but it was all to do about america like i would do anything with american flag and yeah be an american like proud to be an american so i think it would be anything with that uh but yeah besides that i i don't think there's too much i would like just keep it simple do you have a better nickname do you have a nickname that we don't know about no i mean there's so many with my last name because they're like bassett there's all the stuff with like bassy and fish and stuff like that bassett hound i think is what jack price used to call me that um, sounds so jack yeah. price yeah yeah and his british <laughs> accent trying to over here no they all just say coley um all the guys at fine order than here i don't have a nickname yet just since i've only been here a couple days but yeah it's been cold that's the 
universal nickname uh, in all sports, it seems like. Just add a, a Y okay, yeah, onto okay. the end of whatever <laughs> existing name you've got. Uh, let's yeah. talk soccer here. So from Feyenoord and then loan cut short, but they hold on to the purchase option. Back to the Rapids in theory. Now Rapids loaning you to Fortuna Sittard. Um, different style club, different kind of city, a different role we expect. What made this the right move right now for your career? What do you hope comes of this? I, want, I mean, I want to be back at Feyenoord. Um, and I think that was the biggest reason to, to push for this move. I mean, I could have stayed there this year. I didn't have to leave. And, you know, they wanted me to stay as well. But for me, you know, Feyenoord, we had a lot of good midfielders, man. I mean, I thought in Colorado we had, you know, a, a good mix of, of midfielders and tough competition. But, yeah, at Feyenoord we had eight or nine guys that honestly could all be starting games. But, you know, only three could start. So, for me, with the World Cup this year and just making sure long term that I have a chance to be bought by Feyenoord and, and stay here for a while, I think it was better for me to go on loan and play against all the exact same teams that I would have played if I was at Feyenoord and uh, yeah, not be coming off the bench every game because no player wants to be coming off the bench every game. Cole, when, when I was turning professional, I had the opportunity to go trial at Ajax okay. and I just remember seeing the technical ability and at first it was, you know, the reserves and I'm like, all these players are so technically gifted how am I going to get my opportunity to play with the first team? Hunt is banging in goals, Ryan Babel. Yeah. I'm like, this could be years. So you, you kind of start wondering what's the right move for me. Playing time was always the right move, getting, getting the option to play first team minutes. So I, I eventually went to, to Sweden. Now yeah. you're, you're in a position to play in the same league against Ajax, against Feyenoord, your former teammates. What is that going to do for you? What, what are you hoping the, the uh, expectations um, end up? For you yeah I mean probably the biggest thing is to for me I haven't had a double digit scoring season yet uh, even in MLS I my last year there I was hitting the post non-stop and it was yeah it wasn't making me too happy then and yeah I want to have a season where you know I'm well known as a goal scoring midfielder and you know it was tough because like the last I think the last four games at Feyenoord I had three goals uh, coming into the end of preseason so it wasn't like I was just sitting there and doing nothing and not playing and not doing well, but I think that's the main reason to come here is to continue to do that, but also show I can play week in, week out. I mean, the, the technical side, like you talked about at a top club in the Netherlands is it is a different level. And I think that is probably what was probably the toughest part for me coming over here, um, just because so many teams sit very deep and you have to be creative and good in tight spaces. And that was one of the things I needed to work on in MLS. And then it got even heightened here. But, you know, I feel adapted now to it, but um, now it's my chance to go show it, I guess. Your, your first, your first couple of days on on the training pitch with Feyenoord, what what stood out to you as far as the other midfielders? What what were you like? Oh man, that I I gotta come up a little bit, or I gotta learn this, or I really like what what that player is doing. Yeah, uh, I mean to be honest, the first couple of days weren't that bad because I was coming in off a of national camp, so I was feeling pretty good after being with Greg, but I kind of hit a little bit of a lull in like March, I would say. Um, and some of the midfielders we've got Orkun Kokshu, um, who's a, a U20 or yeah, he's 21 years old and yeah, he plays for Turkey and he's, he's unbelievable with the ball, like in tight spaces. He just, he always knows where he's going to go, but, um, he's also got the body coordination and body positioning to be able to get out of stuff. And I think that's the biggest thing that I have to work on is I'm a little bit more lanky and stuff like that. It's not like I don't have the technique to do it but I don't get my body in the situations to get out of stuff. Um, and those are the him and then our six Frederick Arsonist. They're very good at using their body and yeah, being able to manipulate their body in ways that I've never really seen before. What did, uh, what did Feinord tell you about this move? Like, obviously you have to make a decision and, and sort of think about long-term, but you're saying, Hey, I, I want to be there. That's where I want to be. They said they retained the purchase option. I think they have to trigger it and maybe even March. So it's kind of mm -hmm. an early one. Yeah. What was the discussions with that club like? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it almost happened very early on in preseason. Um, and it was a little different compared to the end of preseason because, you know, we only played one game before and it was more like, yeah, just go get your minutes. But as the preseason went on, I started to do really well. So it was a little bit different of letting me go this time. Um, but it was more for them. It was like, you know, go show us that you, you can come back and be a regular starter. We don't have doubts that you could play in our team right now but we're not quite sure that 
you know, every single game you could be scoring a goal or getting an assist, and that's what need, is needed to be at a, a top club like Feyenoord. And, you know, obviously as a player, you back yourself. So, yeah, if a coach wants to see that, you want to go prove yourself um, and go show the coach that, that you can do that. Did uh, the name Zeon Fleming mean anything to you? I mean, it sounds like that's who Sittard says you're replacing, and you talk about double-digit goals. He mm -hmm. sort of had a slow start to his career leaving Ajax and then came and got 12 in a row two seasons mm -hmm. for Sittard. Like, did, are you familiar with him, and, and what kind of role do you think you're going to play uh, with this team? Yeah, I am familiar with him. Uh, I think he scored against us last year when I played against Fortuna. I don't really know him too much. Like, I don't know him personally, and I haven't watched him that much. But uh, the coach did tell me that that was kind of the guy I'm coming in for. And I guess he was a player that, you know, was very good at making late runs into the box and finding spaces in behind the back line. Um, our striker, Burak Yilmaz, is more of a guy that likes to come to and hold the ball up. So there will be a lot of chances to exploit the space in behind when he's kind of coming to the ball. So I think that's kind of maybe the role that I'll be um looking to play for this team in, in the attacking midfield the 10 um, but maybe a little bit deeper as well in certain games you know when we when we're at home and want to control the ball a little bit more maybe it's a little bit more of a dual eight with somebody else but uh yeah most likely the 10. what's your best position do you think like what's the best role for you in the air divisie and how, how's the air divisie different from mls Ooh. i don't really know yet uh exactly what i feel i mean in a double pivot eight uh, I feel most comfortable, I'd say. And probably next to Kellen is when I felt, felt the most comfortable in my career is when I have another eight that's a little bit more defensive than me. And it kind of gives me the freedom to go forward. But, you know, playing as the solo 10, I don't I don't mind it either. And, yeah, the difference between the two leagues, I've always told, you know, the people because they all ask about MLS over here. And it's two just completely different leagues. And I think it's, it's not like MLS is worse or their Eredivisie is so much better yeah the top teams over here are, are very good and i think they would do very well in mls but i think mls it's a lot more bigger spaces and more physicality and yeah more on the physical side um whereas here it's a lot more tight spaces and you have to be good technically and tactically to be able to figure out how teams are playing and break them down you've talked about um being at fine Ord, though and having those tight spaces the game will now change as a team you're playing that's lower down in the table. What's your idea of sort of how you fit into that style and, and what you want to do for the club? Yeah, I mean, that was that was kind of the question I was asking myself when I was coming down here. Like the one thing that uh, Arne Schlott wants me to work on is tight spaces. And yeah, it's not the same system down here. It's, <laughs> it's nothing like that. So it is a little bit weird. But at the same time, when you're playing games, you, you figure it out and you show yourself in games. And I think that was the biggest thing is I couldn't just stay up there training in the tight spaces all the time. I kind of, you know, I needed the games to be released and show what I'm capable of. So, yeah, here it is going to be a bit different. We're, we're not a ball playing team like Feyenoord. It's, it's tough to do that. Um, but I think it, in Colorado, this team is very similar to what I had there in terms of being uh, very compact defensively and then countering. And, you know, at home, we might have the ball as well. So, yeah, I'm just looking forward to getting back up on the field. It's been uh, six months too long. I know you talked about your, your where you need to improve and the playing in tight spaces, but more more importantly, your your body positioning. Mm -hmm. But where do you think you've improved the most since going over there? And your strengths, which have have been awesome in MLS, being being making those late runs into the box as an attacking midfielder. How have you continued to develop on on your strengths? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the thing I think I have developed the most is the tight spaces because I've been so focused in on that. And, you know, I think it's easier with Feyenoord um, to get better at it because you're doing it every day. And the players, in, uh, they all think and move the same way. So it's very easy to play in that system. And then when you come here, it's like, you know, it's a little hard, to be honest, to, to get used to a different style of play and players that don't play and move. And it's actually quite similar to MLS where sometimes it feels like they're giving you a ball and then, they kind of want you to do something with it. Whereas at yeah. Feyenoord, you play and move and there are always these options and you have to help your teammate out. So um, it is going to get me better on the ball here because I'm going to be have to get out of stuff. And I think that actually might help me going back to Feyenoord. Um, and yeah, and then the finishing. We have Robin Van Persie at Feyenoord. So I didn't get to work with him too much, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's still got it. And yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's uh, he coached us a couple of times. He'd come in like every couple of weeks and, 
yeah, I'd show us a, a couple of things to do with finishing and, and just little stuff in the box. And it wasn't like all these finishing drills that I've done in my career. It's literally just in like tight spaces, how he's so good at, you know, getting his shot off and, and cuts and stuff like that. So yeah, I was learning from him and trying to keep developing that. I'd be knocking on his door every day. Hey, yeah. do you have uh, 20 minutes to spare? <laughs> I just, yeah. I just want to learn as much as I can from you. Um, were you surprised at all with the demands of training when you went over? Cause I, I'm not going to lie. When I first went over the importance of performing every single day and it had to be your, your best. And if you dropped off a little, you were on the bench no matter what. And you're like, is it really, do you really grade training that, that extensively? So I'm, sub, I, I'm curious to know how you found our coaches really that adamant about yeah. your training and, and being at your best every single day. Yeah, it is kind of crazy, but now it's like I have those standards for myself. And like my first training down here, it was it was the day before a game, so it was lighter. But I'm so used to at Feyenoord, like every single day is like you're on top of it, exactly how you described it. And I was like, like I'm gonna have to raise the the level here in the standards because once you like hit those standards, you don't want to, you know, take yourself away from that. Like you want to keep pushing and and train like that every day because uh, yeah, it gets to be fun, but. It is crazy, like exactly how you described it. If you have two bad trainings, you're out of the team um, and you have to perform consistently every single week to stay in. So yeah, it, it is tough, but if you're in that starting 11, it's it's got to be a good it's, feeling. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I haven't experienced it. it yet, but I've, yeah, it, it would you'll, be nice. You'll get there. Yeah. What, uh, tell me about the lifestyle side of this because you just turned 21. You're a young guy uh, leaving You know what was a very comfortable situation for you, I assume, in Colorado for – uh, sort of a soccer test, sure, but also just a life test. Uh, and now you make a transition to in cities, and, and Sittard and, and Rotterdam are very different. Uh, how, has, how has sort of the lifestyle been for you uh, in the Netherlands, and how might it change now with your change of scenery? Yeah, it was it was pretty good in Rotterdam. I don't know if any of you guys have been there before. Uh, yeah. I've I mean, been. It, yeah, it, yeah. I've been to a fine art nice. game. That yeah. stadium's decent as well. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, yeah, it's it's a nice city. It's kind of similar to an American city for me with all the, they have a lot of new tall skyscrapers and it wasn't that hard to get used to, to be honest. Um, and the, all those guys there were great. So it was kind of my first time out on my own, but you know, all my friends lived right next to me. So it really didn't feel too much like I was away from home. Uh, now coming down here, I do feel like I am uh, away from home, but at the same time, I think I'm used to it now. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is a part of football, you know, when you're chasing your dream and sometimes you got to take one step back to take two forward. And, you know, I didn't want to be in a small town and, and but I'm, I'm going to be honest, it's it is kind of in the middle of nowhere in the Netherlands. Like there's not much around here. But for me, if I want to get back to Feyenoord, I think this is the step I need to make. And, and while I'm here, I have to enjoy it. Like I can't have a bad attitude about, oh, I'm in, you know, a small city. I'm so far away from home. It's a different team, you know. I gotta embrace it and, and try to do my best here. A lot of a lot of video games. How do you there is time? that is yeah that is exactly what I've been doing. Uh, Austin Trusty, who just moved to Birmingham uh, yes. City. Yeah, me and him have been playing all the time because I don't think where he is in Birmingham is the nicest area either. So yeah, both of us have just uh, we <laughs> just been what are we video what are we games. playing here? <sighs> to be honest, we need the new FIFA to come out. We're uh, I'll, like I don't like playing video games anyways. So then when I gotta play it so much. It's we got Rocket League, FIFA, and uh, Fall Guys. It's like a new one that a lot of people have been playing. But yeah, it's uh, I'm you not guys don't play Call of Duty anymore. I don't. Come on, not, this is not tw this is not 2010, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, right? modern, the decade, modern warfare, the decade has two. changed, bro. The yeah, decade no. has changed. <laughs> that is actually modern coming warfare out too. Was now. was epic. It was it, epic. Yeah, they're doing a new one, uh, Modern Warfare Two, in like a month. So in a month, it'll get better. Okay. But, Right now, it's, maybe I yeah, maybe I get back so on the sticks. <laughs> good way, hey, good way to keep in touch with the yeah. guys in Europe, huh, Charlie? Yeah, That's the yeah. way to do it. D do it you is. speak Dutch, uh, Cole? How's not, your? Yeah, not not the best to be honest. My uh, my two best friends at Feyenoord were um, from South America, and then they're now both in the Premier League, uh, so they're not with me anymore. But I was kind of speaking Spanish with them, and I was okay at Spanish, and now I got pretty good at it. So I was doing Spanish more than Dutch. It's probably going to be more useful them, globally. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Hey, but if you want to be back at Feyenoord, 
Dutch might be the way to go. Yeah, I'm just curious, true. how much did you pay attention to like Luca De La Torre's path here? Because he was on a, a smaller club. I'm pretty sure Eccles got relegated, but then he got his move to La Liga. That's where Spanish could come in handy. Just, <laughs> just shouting that out yeah, down the yeah. line. And then I'm old enough to bring it back to Charlie's days to have been obsessed with Michael Bradley's days at Aaronveen. I'm not saying you need to talk to Michael, but were you familiar? That's like what you want to do, right? He was sort of in that eight attacking midfield position. I want to say he scored 16 goals that season, and that was his breakout at a smaller club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I did look to Luca, and, you know, I remember coming to the Netherlands. A lot of people told me about Michael, even though I haven't thought about that recently, but that is a good point of, of what he did at a smaller club. Um, and, yeah, I talked to Luca last year when we played against him, and, he was saying like, you know, his town was really small and he's like, you know, I really don't enjoy living here, but I think I needed it to come here. And uh, we didn't talk for that long, but I assume, you know, that was his goal. Come here, play. And, and now he's got his big move and now he's playing in La Liga. Uh, so, you know, congrats to him on that. But yeah, I mean, I, I looked at that and I saw, you know, there are people out there watching and the only way you're going to be seen is if you're in games. Nobody sees you if you're training really well at Feyenoord every week. So, yeah, I had to come down here and get games. Dang, Cole just deadpan calling me old here. You're like, oh, yeah, I haven't – Michael Bradley been – yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, you act like we were playing in the 70s. God. Yeah. Geez, <laughs> I don't know, know Charlie. You limped in here with your cane. You talked about Ajax in 1912. <laughs> <laughs> and they call him <laughs> yeah. I think it's felt uh, like that for all of us. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. just a little bit. How, do you talk to Sam Vines at all? Another uh, – one of your boys uh, doing his thing in the, in the Benelux, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we saw each other twice at preseason, and yeah, we talk a little bit, but he's got his girlfriend over here, so we don't see him too much, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> call him out. He's, priorities, oh. priorities. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, well, who's next for the Rapids? If we're talking if we're talking Rapids back, you know, you got a bunch of Academy kids coming up. If you had to put a, a finger on a guy that you would bet to, to kick on, who would it be? tough because a lot of them are my good friends um, <laughs> just name all of them yeah. no don't name one no you know the one i thought was going to break out this year is ali laraz and mm -hmm. i know he hasn't gotten much hype at all but i i really thought he was gonna go and have a good year and then he uh he broke his leg so that that kind of sucked to see him go down um but you know i've been a, a midfield partner with him from, since we were like 15 16 so I really thought since I left, he was going to get a chance in that midfield somewhere throughout the year. Uh, so now it's kind of tough to say. I mean, you got Yappy, you got Seb Anderson, um, him and Abe. But, I mean, Abe's got, you know, it's tough to be a goalkeeper and come in young. So maybe Yappy. Uh, I'll go Yappy. I don't know what happens with Giassi after this year. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. Do you get to watch much, or like, uh, is it in a bad time zone for you? Yeah, it's always in the 3 a.m. over here, so I can never watch. But I do, I do wake up and, and watch the highlights. Uh, normally in the locker room, I'll watch them and just catch up because you know I still got a lot of good friends over there. So, just hoping somebody somebody catches a glimpse and asks <laughs> you about the league. What what do they ask you, by the way, about MLS? Yeah, a lot of people seem to be curious about like what it's like. You know, maybe if things aren't working out here, to go over there and. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people seem to like just the lifestyle aspect, but I tell them all, like, from the time I came into the league, which I think was 2018, which wasn't that long ago, but in the last four years, like, how much the league has changed since I came in, it's it's crazy. And I tell them about all these players that, you know, they don't really realize unless you're actually there playing against them week in, week out, like, how good some of these guys are. Like, when you go up against Reynoso, like, I always thought he was one of the toughest guys for me to go to go up against. Like, I don't think they realize the quality. Like, if that guy was over here, I think he'd be doing the exact same thing to, to some of these players. So, I tell him oh, that the yeah, league is growing. Spot on. So, uh, I just has, don't has think Has your they style know. come up? I has your style has. improved? Yeah, yeah, it has. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, when you finally, like, see, the tough thing is you never can, like, uh, go out with friends or anything over here. So, it's not like you get to wear stuff out much. But, yeah, it's, and you know, Amsterdam, it's, uh, it's got a lot of fashion, uh, just people in general that, that love to wear different types of things. So, yeah, I've been trying to up my game a little bit. It's like osmosis, man. I remember when I moved to New York City and I got on the subway and I was like, oh, God, I look like a person from Kansas <laughs> here on vacation. You took off your cowboy boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah I had to take, you know, put, the, yeah, the put the cowboy hat back in the in the closet said, okay, yeah. save that for the time and the place. Uh, last but one he kept that we'll shirt tucked into those chinos, Charlie, yeah. just <laughs> in case. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, just oh, nice yes. and cinched in the belt for yeah. you. He kept, say, uh, he kept saying, sin gas. 
<laughs> well, I said, try to try to try to fool him, Charlie. Make me feel European, man. What kind of water you want? Flat? So, congas, singas? Is there is there a scenario that sees you come back to MLS, uh, Cole? I know that that's part of some of the. You know, there's a clause here that like if you don't get the playing time that the Rapids want you to get, that you could be back for 23. Is there a possibility we see you back in MLS? I mean, I definitely want to come back later on in my career i i really hope it's not within the next year to be honest i i definitely want to continue my my dream and aspirations over here um but i think definitely down the road i mean I, yeah i don't want to end up living over here uh like yeah charlie i think you probably felt the same way when you came over just you know you're you wanted to come back 100%. to america so yeah i think down the you road wanna, yeah. you want to embrace it you, yeah. embrace it tra travel as much as you can meet as many people but once you taste that level you're like i'm i'm not going back yeah like, yeah. you know, I, that, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. I mean, my first game, I flew home after our uh, Conference League final uh, last year against Roma. And I flew back and watched Nashville versus Colorado. And I was like, I'm not coming back to this. Like, after what I experienced, you know, you, you, we got to play against Jose Mourinho and, and stuff like that. And you're just like, you know what? Like, I'm not coming back here for a while. Like, there's no way I'm going to let myself, yeah, give up on, on what I've wanted my whole life uh, just so quickly. So. Yeah, that's why I'm going to do everything I can here to hope that, you know, Feyenoord triggers that buy option. Chasing the dream. Uh, we'll see uh, We'll see how it goes. Hope for the best for you, man. Looking for a Michael yeah. Bradley season. I do have one last question, and this is very typical of me. You mentioned U.S. camp, and we haven't asked you about uh, any conversations with Greg or, or what you're shooting for there because you are still uh, U23 eligible, obviously, uh, but then the, the senior national team, where you stand with the, uh, with the national team programs right now and how – how recent have conversations been? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough when you don't play. Like, before coming over here, I was like, you know, if I break into the starting 11, it's, I think I'll have a very good shot of going to the World Cup. I mean, if you're a starter at Feyenoord, I wouldn't say it guarantees you, but you would have a pretty good shot of going to that World Cup. And, you know, now that I haven't been starting for six months, I really have to do well in these next couple of months. Um, you know, I haven't really talked to any of the coaches, to be honest, recently after preseason Anthony Hudson just because I had him in Colorado uh, messaged me once but besides that uh, yeah not too much and I think it's really just up to me I mean if you're playing well these next couple months then yeah you'll have a good chance to go but yeah right now I'm not too focused on that uh, I just got to do well these these first couple months and then yeah we'll see we'll see what happens we're gonna see you debut on Saturday what do you think I hope so the the work permit needs to get done uh, that's the only thing I, I've never heard of it before, but like I already had a work permit at Feyenoord. And then when I moved here, I had to get another one within the same country. So <laughs> I, I don't understand why, but it's already taken a week and I'm hoping it has to be done by tomorrow night. So we will see. All right. Chop, chop. Let's get Fingers that. Uh, crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. legal. Let's get the legal side handled. We need to see uh, our boy Cole yeah. plan for Fortuna. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. Always good to talk. Yes. Yeah, you guys as well. Thanks for having me on. All right, we finished with the mailbag. Big thanks to Cole Bassett for uh, calling in from uh, the border between the Netherlands and Germany. We'll see how his season goes. We're wishing the best for him. Nathan Ford in Should Minnesota. Should we do an ETR trip thanks. to Sittard? Yes, we're going Are we to Sittard. Are well we're going? Yeah, yeah right. we're doing it, baby. Right. We're, we're Tell me, we're going on vacation to Sittard, Netherlands. <laughs> Which... Here we are in beautiful Sitard. Um, sorry, if you are from Sitard, we love you, and we hope that you treat our boy Cole, uh, Coley, Listen, cool guy, cool guy yeah. Cole, or whatever they call him. Listen, Weeby's from uh, Wichita. Absolute. He gets it. He understands. I get it. Yeah, I know what it's like to be provincial. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay. from New York, so uh, I don't get it. Oh uh, well, Long Island technically. Gross. Nathan Ford says, uh, "Wanted to say thank you for the amazing live show at Blackheart. MLS became my favorite league as an Iowa neutral around 2015, and the pod oh, has been a Nathan. big reason why." Uh-huh. I've adopted the loon since moving to Minnesota, and Sunday night added to the pride I feel for the soccer community. Really appreciate the work you all do, and you'll be hope you'll be back in Minnesota soon. Here's his five favorite moments from the live show night. Number five, his Orange Theory household finding out Weeby is an Orange Theory guy. Can't explain it, but it makes too much sense. What's his splat points per 90? Nice. I'm very out of shape, so I'm rocking like 25 to 30 a class right now, Nathan. Normally, the more out of shape night. you are, the more points you get because you... I thought... Cause yeah, because you're burning a lot. Yeah, oh, I'm burning. Yeah. I'm burning. Don't worry about that. The look on David Goss's face when I tried to explain why my fiance was wearing a mixed disc root NYCFC this jersey. This was like the opening two minutes of the night, and I was like, what just happened? 
Who's yeah. that? We need to meet this person. Uh, the shushers in the crowd helping us hear the show amid the bar background noise and displaying a perfect representation of Minnesota. Nice. Uh, two, realizing when I got home that the jersey Anders handed me is signed by Nacho Piatti, oh. slash simply having something that says Montreal Impact now in my possession. What a treasure that is. And number one, my fiance, not much of a soccer fan, but more of an Allianz Field, Brew Hall, Blackheart fan, a.k.a. likes to go place and drink beers. Uh, walking out of the bar and saying, quote, I figured I'd have fun, but that was actually for real super fun. Sure, the numbers say you bought us all off with BAM. That's beer allocation money, but we watched the whole show and didn't just look at the stats. <laughs> legend. Beer allocation money. Legend, yeah. And then Let's David go. and Skokie, a legend, says, I'll admit that the All-Star game wasn't high on my priority list, but watching the MLS All-Stars kill off most of the last few minutes by passing around the League of MX guys was incredibly satisfying. On Diamo, I agree. I was resi- I was trying to start like the Olay up on the top of the brew hall. It didn't come off. And CM Leota ends us by saying we should have a Liga MX versus MLS All-Star game that continues but should be the east side of Liga MX with the east side of the uh, MLS conferences and then the west side of MLX, MLS with the west side of Liga MX, which is very convoluted and fits this show to a T. Oh so God. that's it for us. That broke me. Yeah, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Adios. <laughs>Congratulations, you made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of Extra Time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.